My name is JP Eason. I am a course director in the new film production master's program. It is a wonderful honor today to be able to introduce Chase Hevener. He is a full sale digital media grad and a founder of visual and video production company Fiction, which is based right here in Winter Park. So we're all grateful for that, right? Chase's career started as a professional wakeboarder. He then began producing short wakeboarding documentaries, which led him into broadcast production with Fuel TV. About five years ago, he decided to make the move out of wakeboarding and start his production company, Fiction. Some of the companies Fiction has worked with include ESPN, Publix, the International Space Station, Tim Tebow, Shepard Ferry, Oakley, and another, a, a number of high-end visual brands. Uh, Chase, thank you for being with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, Chase is going to, we're going to talk about quadcopters today. He has a presentation he'd like to show us, and then we're going to enter into a Q&A, so take it away. Cool. Well, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, my name is Chase Hevener, as you heard, and I run a production company here in Winter Park. Um, I'm here today to talk to you guys about quadcopters, RC, aerial photography, um, and how that kind of applies to you guys and how you can get into it. Uh, and so what I thought would be cool was first we would show one of our reels for the company, uh, and then, I don't know if the slides are up yet, um, and then we kind of get into some price points, kind of the technology, how to get started, kind of from base level to total professional, totally crazy custom builds of helicopters, and then focus on uh, this one in particular, which is the DJI Phantom. Uh, and this is what I shot this reel on completely. Um, and we'll really get into this, because I think this applies to you guys the best. Um, so I think what would be cool now is to play the reel.
So let's talk about getting started. Um, there's a lot of really cool products out there, especially for you guys who have never flown before. Um, the way I got started was with these little micro RC helicopters. They're about this big, kind of range from this to kind of maybe about four by four. Um, and they're really cool, they're really durable. Uh, I kind of fly them in my free time in my office inside and just get to know how to, how to fly and how to practice with these things. I thought it'd be fun to fly this one in here today, if you guys are cool with that. Um, there we go. So you can kind of crash it into things, crash it into yourself, it doesn't really hurt you. Um, but anyways, these are really cool tools just to learn how to fly. Um, and then once you learn how to fly, the next level up would be kind of these mid-range uh, quadrocopters, which is what the DJI Phantom falls under. Um, they're still relatively affordable, uh, around $700 to $2,000. Um, and we'll get into this product specifically, like I was saying. But uh, these are really for you guys where you can still have some fun, learn to experiment, learn to do all kinds of crazy shots that you want to get and not worry about crashing it because these are all plastic parts. This is all plastic blades. It's a GoPro. Everything's pretty affordable, pretty replaceable. Um, you know, and you'll see it's relatively inexpensive once you start getting into the next level. Um, so the next level would be kind of a more of a DSLR rig. Uh, and this is just a whole other world when you get into what it takes to actually operate one of these things. So with this, you're kind of wherever the Wherever the front of this is, is where the shot's going to be. Um, when you get into these things, you have full controls of the camera. So what that means is I have pan tilt, full 360, and then there's somebody operating the helicopter. So it's kind of a three-man crew. So you can kind of see over here, uh, you have one person flying the helicopter. I'm usually operating uh, the camera, and then you'll have a person managing all the video coming in. So there's usually a video camera on the back of the quad or the helicopter, and then there's a, there's a feed coming out of the actual camera. Um, so this is a much, much bigger scale of production uh, and, and a much bigger investment. Uh, so it's kind of a different ballpark. And then uh, these are kind of what I'm calling heavy lifters, and this is a totally experimental, totally custom uh, kind of part of the industry. Uh, they kind of range from forty to $100,000 plus. I mean, you can get really crazy if you want to, but basically the only people uh, that are capable of flying Reds or Alexas or any kind of major camera are building their own uh, helicopters and doing it fully based around the camera. So this, is, this one in particular is about an eight-foot wingspan, uh, and it's built for the Red Epic. And, and it's kind of something, and we'll talk about that a little bit, that we've, we're really kind of focusing on this right now, and we partner with people like this company, which is XCAM, run by a guy named Jordy Klein, uh, and he pretty much builds rigs for cameras. And so he's got a whole arsenal of these crazy machines, and then we get to fly them and I get to operate the camera, so it's really fun. Um, so I thought it'd be cool now to kind of focus on the DJI Phantom specifically. Uh, this quadrocopter has really become really popular, especially for you know, people like me just kind of getting into this, and for students in particular, um, just because it's, again, really affordable, really durable, but you can get really great shots, especially with the GoPro. Uh, you can get a base level model for about $500 uh, to $700, depending on what the model is, and then all in, when you get FPVs, get the gimbal, uh, get the GoPro, you're looking at about $17 to $2,000. And the other cool thing about this is it's really portable. So as you saw on the demo reel, like fortunately we get to travel for work, so I kind of bring this thing with me wherever I go, and I just kind of set it up. I can be kind of up and flying within two minutes of opening the box, and then be closed and walk away and no one knows that was there kind of thing. Uh, but it's really portable, it's really fun to travel with, and uh, this is a really huge feature for this product because when you have the, the bigger ones, like I was showing you, it's about an hour setup, so you kind of have to put it together, get all the links working right, and it's not just like put it on the ground and start flying. Uh, so to talk specifically again about this, they've done some really cool things with the flight controls. Um, Basically, this thing's constantly communicating with GPS for its position in space. So as you can see here, I'm not touching anything on the controls, and it's floating there. Uh, with a normal helicopter, you're pretty much 
tweaking this thing constantly to just basically hover, and it's not auto-correcting anything. Uh, so this is full, full on auto-corrected, full on hovering without me touching any of the controls. And that's a really big thing for safety. It's a really big thing for, for new pilots uh, kind of getting into this. You don't really have to know how to fly uh, conventional RC helicopters to really get into this. You can kind of day one be flying, which is pretty, pretty unheard of. Um, some of the modes, or actually, no, let's talk about the gimbal. So this is really the distinguishing factor, in my opinion, of, of this machine. Uh, they did a really good job with this. It's a very simple gimbal. And basically, all this is a, is a horizon stabilizer. So as you can see, I'm kind of whipping this thing around. You'd never really be doing this in a real scenario. But uh, all it's doing is keeping the horizon stable. So you're going to get insanely smooth shots. And the, again, the GoPro is just incredible now. So you can really do some amazing things with this little machine. Uh, a couple modes that are really cool for beginners. Um, and this one's called GPS mode. And uh, again, like this is kind of safety based. Uh, but what happens here is you can see when I let go of the controls here, basically the quad's just going to stop wherever I let go of it. So kind of the idea is if you ever get too far away or if you ever feel like you're out of control, just let go and everything just kind of hovers. And then you can kind of walk up and get your bearings and figure out where you are, bring it back, continue your shot, whatever you want to do. Um, or if you kind of want to come to a slow stop, you can kind of figure out where your space is and it'll kind of easy ease into it. Um, another mode that's really nice is uh, it's called attitude mode. And so what this is, you saw a lot of the shots where I was kind of flying through trees and uh, doing weird, crazy shots, is what I'll do is I'll try to find a straight line. And I try to have no obstructions within that straight line. And what this mode does is basically whatever position, front, back, left, right, I let go of the controls, uh, this will keep going in that position uh, in a straight line. So you can get really cool dolly shots. Uh, you know where you're going to be going if you let go of it. So you kind of can set up shots with that. Um, so we shot this stuff yesterday. Uh, and I was going to show a couple shots that we shot with our, my friend Dylan here uh, in the park, just kind of uh, illustrating some of these modes. So I guess I have uh, the main thing I want to talk about moving forward is that obviously we have a lot of people who might be interested in this technology. Uh, you know, it's nice that it is becoming more and more affordable. Uh, I, I just was wondering, I already saw that there's a price discrepancy when I was looking online. It seemed, you said you can get the base model for around $500, mm -hmm. but then it's about $1,700 uh, for all the add-ons. Can you maybe go over the specifics about what is really needed in terms of the add-ons and what you can get away without? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at this model particularly, this would kind of be what I would suggest as your base level of kind of getting into the game. Uh, you really need the gimbal to be doing the smooth shots. If you don't have it, it's just really going to be pretty shaky. Uh, there's a couple other add-ons, which uh, is a thing called an FPV, which are, I don't know if you've seen this, but basically you'll see guys like wearing goggles and flying this thing. Uh, it's basically a video feed coming from the GoPro so you can see what you're shooting. And, and, and that's really kind of the next level, but you don't necessarily need it. But I, I usually fly with one of those, with these. And are you going through the Wi-Fi from the GoPro? In no, order it's to a microwave signal. A oh, microwave yeah, signal? Yeah, so you have actual antenna coming out of the back of the quad, and then you have an antenna plugged into a TV. Well, I know that the, the Hero 3 actually has a Wi-Fi signal that you can send. I mean, mm -hmm. do you think that's something that is the range just too great that yeah. you might not be able I mean, to send it? That's like 30 feet, I think. 30 feet, this, yeah. You know, you're 30 feet right off the bat with this thing. So, so you're saying that, um, that the gimbal is really the most important add-on? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's just a stabilization issue. I mean, you know, basically what's happening is when you do a turn, the, the quad's kind of doing a right or left pitch. And if, you're not, if you don't have the gimbal, the camera and the horizon is going to do that. So basically, it just keeps this thing really steady. So, I mean, I really love watching that reel. I think that there's just so many beautiful shots there. Uh, you know, when I see that, though, I feel like I would, I would not be able to accomplish that. With the, it would take weeks of practicing. Like, maybe can you tell us a little bit about how long, how much of a learning curve there is with this thing? 
Uh, well, I've been flying RC aircraft uh, for a long time, uh, and just kind of, I've, I've even built my own, and, and I've just kind of been a fan of, of doing the sport, if you will. Um, but uh, it, I would say, you know, you could probably be doing some of those shots within like a month of just like learning to fly. I mean, like what I would usually do, and I still do just to practice, is I'll just kind of go into a field and just do figure eights just to like get my bearings, because what happens is, the controls are all fine when everything's pointing forwards, and then when you flip it, you instantly have to kind of flip your perspective on how you're flying. Uh, and actually, uh, with the DJI Phantom, they've, they've done an algorithm where you don't have to do that, and it still flies. Like, so if you're flying towards yourself, you can still go right, and it'll go that way. But I just don't, I don't like to fly that way, just because I've trained myself not to do that. But. Also, the, I mean, some of the best shots, I think, are when you're actually coming through the trees, mm -hmm. and it feels like the branches are just so close, and it's hard to imagine that the camera can even fit through the gaps that you're putting it through. Uh, I'm just wondering how technically difficult those shots are, and kind of also how durable this is, because it seems inevitably it's going to snag a branch, mm -hmm. it's going to hit into a wall, something bad's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, that, is it kind of like investment over once it hits the tree? No, no, not necessarily. And, and like I was saying before and illustrating with that attitude mode, like I try to set a path that's a straight line and I know I can get through it without any obstruction. So if you know you have that path, you just kind of pull straight back. But I mean, you definitely, I've definitely crashed a few of these things. Um, and uh, they're very durable. I was flying in the snow a couple weeks ago and I, it flew and somehow landed upside down in the snow and it got soaking wet, pulled it out, hour later it was fine. So this thing is like pretty much a workhorse. Cool. Nice. So can you tell us a little bit about, I, you know, one thing I, I, I like about the product demo is that we really get to showcase the DJI Phantom, we get to see what mm -hmm. it's capable of doing. Uh, what, what's the strategy that goes into, you know, why, why are you doing product demos? Why, you know, what type of ap applicable use does this particular uh, quadcopter have? For the company? For the company, yeah. So for us, um, we, we do a lot of original content for ourselves. And so what we did with this piece is uh, we do product tests and, and we kind of try to target outlets like The Verge, Gizmodo, and Gadget, tech blogs, uh, that we want to push our product so that we can get more eyes uh, on our company uh, and get the people who you know, would use our video services uh, coming to us and seeing our website. And so we do, uh, you know, all kinds of different product tests, and this was one of them. Uh, but, you know, it's just, a, it's just a really good way for us to reinforce our brand, you know, that we're cutting edge and that we do cool visuals and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of a strategy piece for us, but uh, it's fun too, so. <laughs> and I know, you so your background is in wakeboarding, and you got started making these documentaries for Fuel TV mm -hmm. about wakeboarding and extreme sports in general. Um, uh, you know, it seems like there's really obvious practical applications for this in terms of sports, especially extreme, extreme sports. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you imagine this as a tool being used uh, for that type of a space, but also what else could it be good for in terms of people who might not be getting involved in sports filmmaking? Sports specifically, I mean, they had one in the Olympics uh, this year. I don't know if anybody saw it, but they're in the uh, slope style and all the half pipe and everything, you would see this quad just going flying down the mountains, which was really cool. Um, so obviously in action sports, you know, like, and you saw like some of our boat surfing stuff, like I'll, I, you can be flying uh, while you're driving the boat and getting really cool shots. So it's just a, in my opinion, it's just a really cool angle to get that you really couldn't get before without a helicopter. Um, but specifically for general filmmaking, you know, I, I think it's probably uh, a B-roll shot or two. Uh, but the, the great thing about all of these, all the way up to the $100,000 models, is that even at, that, even at those prices, you're still insanely more affordable than an actual helicopter. So, I mean, that's like the biggest plus to all these things is you can be getting the helicopter shot for this crazy low price. Uh, at least when you buy them and, and go all in with them. So it's, it's kind of a win-win. A yeah, and so can you talk just maybe a little bit more about, I mean, so you've been filming with the GoPro, with the Phantom, mm -hmm. and then at a certain point, it's necessary. You say, you know what, the GoPro is not going to be able to get what I'm after here. At what point do you say we really need to go up to FS or SLR or we need to go up to the RED? 
it just depends, honestly, on, on what you want to shoot uh, and the quality of footage you want to get. You know, obviously the GoPro is pretty limited as to how, how, you know, what lenses you can put on it and the actual footage, you know. It's just really up to you what the kind of shot you want uh, would determine what helicopter you should fly uh, and the level of production value that you really want to get. I don't know when that is for you guys, yeah. but... I guess it's different for everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. So can you just tell us also about the... Um, I mean, I thought that was an amazing shot that you had of that rig with the red. Mm -hmm. Can you just, you said it takes an hour to set up. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe tell us more about that entire process. So basically, these guys are getting giant sheets of uh, carbon, carbon graphite, and then giant rods of carbon graphite, and they'll CNC all these machine pieces out and then build it. So it's not like you can just put this thing in a case and, and just run. Like, you have to take it fully apart. And then when you get to location, you have to kind of reassemble, screw all the screws in, balance the camera, do all this stuff, get all your feeds going, and then you start testing to fly, to see if you can get the shot. And then once all the tests are done, then you can actually do the shot. So it's, it's probably actually about two hours before you're shooting. But I bet the footage is amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 4K RC heli footage is the craziest thing you've ever seen. Do they have larger range? I mean, so what, what's the range on one of these things? Uh, I think technically the... The radio frequency will go about a mile, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, and maybe this would be a good time to talk about kind of some of the regulations involved in, in RC flying. Um, but uh, you're supposed to stay under 400 feet in line of sight with all kind of recreational RC vehicles, um, and that's FAA required kind of deal. But you can you can fly uh, in most places as long as it's not a highly populated area, kind of thing. So, what other safety concerns do you worry about out in the field? Uh, Safety-wise, you just you never know. I mean, there's, it's a wireless flying machine, so uh, you don't really want to be in a place where this thing can go out of control and go spiraling into a crowded audience. You know, um, that's just not the best idea. So you try to want to fly in safe places, open fields, that kind of thing. Uh, not around people, um, and, and actually right now uh, it is technically illegal to be for hire uh, to run a business around flying quads, or around RC helicopter aerial videos in general, according to the FAA. So, uh, so it's kind of like this whole conversation right now about you know, what, what's going to happen to the industry, uh, which is kind of interesting. But, I mean, it is interesting because there's, it's a much broader conversation mm -hmm. than just the film industry and how they're going to start using these RC helicopters. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there's the military drones that everybody's talking about, but then I, I know that they just kind of designated six states and Florida is not one of them as testing grounds for these types of devices. Uh, I mean, so what, but I mean, I, I, it's, it's amazing to me that it, you can't, use it commercially at the moment? I mean, so what is your hopes for this technology? Where do you think we're heading? My I hope would be that uh, it does become legal, but it becomes highly regulated. Uh, and I think I'm a proponent of, of regulation because you're in airspace, you know? I mean, uh, I think it can potentially be really dangerous. Um, and they're not toys, you know, they're, they're serious machines. I mean, you saw the, the big one, it's an eight foot wingspan. I mean, that's literally a helicopter with really fast moving blades. So you don't want to mess around with these things. Um, but I do think, you know, eventually like the conversation will, will lead to uh, hopefully uh, us being able to run legitimate businesses and, and selling services around flying machines, which would be great for everybody, I think. I mean, it definitely also seems like there's a lot of energy that's being invested into this technology. Yeah. So you would imagine that even though the price point is already coming down, mm -hmm. that it's going to keep going down and that the equipment's gonna become better and better, yep. and that hopefully they figure it out, right? I think so, I think, I, I, I don't know, I'm not really that much of a part of the conversation, and I'm by no means like uh, uh, someone to speak about the law. I've, I would suggest if you do wanna learn more about this, go to the FAA's website and read everything they have to say, because it's pretty interesting. Um, but I do know in 2015, there's gonna be some new rules and regulations coming out, and uh, I think that's still kind of an ongoing conversation as to what that's gonna be. And can you talk, uh, what about, I know that there's also some privacy concerns, there's mm -hmm. also some concerns in terms of rights and releases, I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? I don't, I'm, I haven't researched enough into that world to really speak on it, but yeah. uh, I think that's kind of the crux of the other side of the argument, is that, uh, you know, 
these things are potential. Um, there's some potential privacy issues with this stuff, and I think uh, you know, it's kind of hard to to really pinpoint it all into one place, sort of deal. Well, I mean, it's interesting just because historically, I mean, the camera stays on the ground, mm -hmm. and you have total control over exactly where it goes, and you can't. I mean, you can't drive into someone's property and put down your camera, but now all of a sudden. Once the camera gets airborne, it sort of brings in this whole new set of legal issues that need to be thought through. Yep. And yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, so I mean, I guess that the thing is, do you feel like this is just for hobbyists, or I mean, in terms of no, what the I mean, are? I think there's serious issues that need to be dealt with. I just, I, you know, it it's not gonna unless unless it's just a total ban on all of it, it's not gonna, people are gonna start to still make these things, you know, and people are gonna still find them for recreation, so it's gonna have to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form. I just don't know what that is. So yeah. I'm sitting on the sidelines waiting. Sitting on the sidelines waiting. So <laughs> let's, let's kind of go back to the product itself. Um, can you tell us, uh, you know, I saw a video that you posted where you actually have, you know, you were talking about you transmit the radio frequency, hmm. how much of your cinematography is based off of the visuals you're getting in terms of feedback from the camera, and how much of it is you just looking at the device in the air and trying to pick a line and stay with it? <clears throat> with this one in particular, I, I, I haven't been flying with an FPV, which is what you call the visual stuff. Um, so I just kind of think I know where the shot's gonna go, and I hope I get it. Um, but when you're flying with the bigger machines, I mean, I don't. I'm not even looking outside of the screen. Like I'm basically just focusing on the screen, and then I have a radio uh, right here where I'm just kind of controlling the camera and doing whatever I want. So, so I mean, it sounds like then it just has to do with practicing, with becoming more comfortable with the controls yeah. and the device itself. Yeah, and and when you get into the bigger rigs, like I I would basically be directing where the helicopter goes, and uh, so I would say, okay, I want to start here. I want to end way over there, and then while he's flying in that straight line or whatever he's doing, uh, I'll just kind of do all my shots and point straight down and do whatever I want. So, so when he was in the field, kind of walking through the field, I mean, are you do you have your shots planned out when you take the helicopter off? On the last off? shots? Yeah. Uh, not really. I just said do a couple walk cycles, and I just tried to follow and illustrate some stuff. I mean, with this thing, you can shoot a bunch of shots really quickly, and just I probably shot. 10 different shots and use two of them. You right, know what yeah. I mean? So it's just like, shoot as much as you want with these things. So basically just, you're, you're doing a flyby, you're trying to yeah. get some vertical motion, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of, I, I mean, I, I hate to leave the phantom, but you know, I, I keep thinking about these higher quality models. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk, I mean, we talked about the high range, now the low range. Can you talk about that middle range right there where you're mounting that's, the SLR? And that's kind of where we're as a business, like trying to figure out if we want to get into. Uh, and it's obviously like a lot more of an investment. Uh, I think going back to the current regulations, um, it's kind of like we're still trying to figure out if we really want to step it up because there's a chance that this could not be legal in 2015 and, and now we're stuck with this machine that we can't sell a service around. So. Uh, it's still going to be fun, and I'll still probably get one just because I want to shoot with it. But uh, you know, it's that's kind of the. I think that's where everybody's at. There's people that are that are definitely doing it, um, but it's too much of a risk for us right now to put that much of an investment in it. So, what would the investment be in that middle range? Uh, uh, Ten to twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, and it's a lot more work. I mean, you have to have the customer service from the actual vendor to like fix this thing. Cause like this, you just go buy a new one if it doesn't work. The, the, the bigger ones, like if one wire pops, you gotta send it back in three weeks. So, so you are working then with private companies that assemble these things mm -hmm. custom made? Yeah, it's like hobby shops basically. And they'll build it for you. And then if it breaks, you send it back and they'll probably send you a loaner or something. So, so you actually go into them and you say, here's my camera, mm -hmm. here's what I'm wanting to do. They weigh the camera, they try to, you know, they do their own, or do they have a plan that they work from, or are they just make, build it totally I custom? I basically say, here's the camera I want to fly, and then they build those mid-range or $10,000 ones around the camera and balance all the gimbals and everything around it. Yeah. I mean, so, 
I know this is an octocopter. We're talking about oct or we're talking about quadcopters, but mm. I also saw that you know as you get to the larger models that oftentimes there can be eight different propellers. I mean, so do you have any recommendation? But then I also saw when you had that single red blade. mounted, a single blade. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what, what are the considerations in terms of stability, in terms of which one of those technologies Yeah, it just better? depends on how aggressive you want to fly. So uh, with the bigger ones, you know, they're very kind of aggressive and they can do a lot more things than the big, big, huge octocopters. And the big, huge octocopters are kind of more like Cadillacs in the air. Uh, is what we call them, but they just kind of move real slow, but they're really steady. Uh, and then when those single blades, I mean, those things are crazy. I mean, you can go 90 miles an hour flying down the, flying through the air with a red strap to it. It's pretty cool. So, I mean, so obviously that is then a replacement for a helicopter, right? <laughs> Is what? That, I mean, that essentially is a helicopter. Yeah. I mean, you're not... Yeah, and they're going to get bigger. I mean, the, uh, the guy who we fly with, with the big one, he's building one for an Alexa, which has a 50-pound 50, 50 limit as to what it can carry. So that's a big machine. I mean, if that thing's flying 90 miles an hour, and you're not allowed to let these things go out of your line of sight, how do you even navigate that as a filmmaker? You can see it you know, pretty far, but... But it's really up to the helicopter operator to really kind of say, like, I can't go that far uh, kind of right. thing. But it'll go, like, you can go a mile if you want to. Just, right, and I guess the bigger they get, the farther you can see them, too, Yeah, right? it's just you really lose perspective at a certain level. So even with these little things, you know, you get 500 feet in front of you, and it's gone. You don't know which way is right, which way is left, and you start trying to bring it back, and you're going the wrong right. way, and it keeps going farther kind of thing. So you kind of want to keep keep it within a range that you can manage sort of deal. So in terms of pros and cons, I'm wondering if you could, we've talked a lot about the pros, I think. We've been talking about why these are really good tools. We've been talking about how they're getting more affordable. I do have, and I mean, some cons in terms of the legality of mm -hmm. it. I mean, are there other cons that we should consider before investing in something like this? Uh, no, I mean, I think we've covered it. I, I just think, especially, you know, I think since we're talking to students and, and you guys about thinking about getting into it, I just really think that these mid-range to, like, lower cost uh, and, and highly durable machines are probably the best, um, and, and it's just trainers, you know? Like, we just use this as a, as, as a fun tool, you know? Like, just to get cool shots, and I just, I just like flying these things, and I like training with them, so um, this is primarily what I use most of the time. So uh, that, this would be my suggestion if you're going to really get into it. But I mean, so you already told me, though, before that you, this is your fourth Phantom? Oh, yeah, yeah. We have like, I have like two backups right oh, now. So, I mean, so it's not that the three, the fir three first ones just went down. No, the three first ones went down. They went down? Yeah. Do you have any spectacular <laughs> death stories for any of your Phantoms? Oh, man. Um, I mean, yeah. Let's see. We had, we had one hanging out of a tree from the gimbal wire, and uh, one of my friends had to climb up the tree and get it, and it still worked, which was nice. I, I don't know, these things just, they're so durable, I crash, I don't even worry about crashing them. That's why I think probably like you see crazy shots, because I'm like not worried if I hit something, because I have a backup, and it'll just go fly right after that. So, so you just kind of retired it and took it out of commission? Yeah, but uh -huh. like, they usually work after you crash them. What usually breaks is the gimbal. Uh, and so uh, what happens is we just use them as trainers and, and kind of like some of the guys in the company will start flying them and, and we'll just mess around with them. So they don't all go to waste. Cool. Well, uh, any, any parting thoughts for our audience in terms of people who are seriously considering investing in this technology? Uh, yeah, like if you guys have any questions for me, like I I'm happy to be a resource for any of this stuff um, and get into it. It's fun. It's, uh, it's a great little tool to get some really cool shots. Cool. Well, thank you, Chase. Yeah. I appreciate it.